Hello everyone, this is Seher from Dentabest and today we are going to do the review of physiology. Uh, so we can see uh, the contents here. So we'll start with your neurophysiology, then we'll go to the muscle physiology, respiratory, renal fluid and acid base, GI, endocrine. So you can see more details about what I discussed on the last slide about the refractory period, absolute relative, repolarization and the hyperpolarization state. Okay, so we already know about uh, the local anesthetic mechanism, the excitatory and the inhibitory neurotransmitter. The saltatory conduction is a jumping kind of conduction that happens in the myelate and nerve fiber impulse jump from one node of Ranvier to another. Then we know the continuous conduction, unmyelated fiber, uh, saltatory is around 100 times faster conduction than the continuous conduction. And different types of nerve uh, degenerations like Wallerian degeneration, we already discussed in oral surgery, that's important. Now we can see some more uh, terms here like total peripheral resistance, that's a vascular resistance of the systemic circulation and TPR equals to MAP that is mean arterial pressure minus CVP that is central venous pressure over CO that is the cardiac output. CVP is 0 mm of mercury under normal condition. So TPR equals to MAP over CO and MAP equals to CO times TPR by cross multiplication. So this is the formula MAP equals to CO times TPR mean arterial pressure is same as the blood pressure. Now the factors that increase and decrease the TPR like cold vasoconstriction will increase the TPR, exercise uh, causing vasodilatation will decrease the TPR. So what is TPR? TPR mainly regulates the blood flow from systemic circulation into the venous circulation while cardiac output is blood flow from the veins back into the arterial system. So this is important that you can go through it. Now blood pressure as we know is CO times TPR and the systolic over diastolic the normal is 120 over 80. MAP is also equals to diastolic blood pressure plus pulse pressure over 3. Now what is cardiac output? Cardiac output is amount of blood pumped per minute that is called as the cardiac output that is around 5 liters, 5.6 liters per minute. What is stroke volume? Stroke volume is the amount of blood ejected with every beat. And stroke volume equals to end diastolic minus end systolic. And average stroke volume we have is around 70 to 80 ml. Now ejection fraction is a proportion of end diastolic blood pumped out during diastole. Now there is a mechanism called as Frank Sterling mechanism. It states that the main determinant of cardiac output is venous return. So more blood is returning back to the heart, more is the heart pumping the blood. So that is Frank Sterling. Now we can see the electrophysiology. We know about the SA node, which is a pacemaker of the heart. From here, the impulse will travel to the AV node, then to the bundle of his or Purkinje fibers, and finally to the ventricular myocytes, causing ventricular contraction. Now, the important one, definitely we know, are the ECG waves. So you should know what is P wave, PR interval, like P wave stands for atrial depolarization, PR interval length between depolarization of atria and depolarization of ventricle, then the QRS complex that stands for ventricular depolarization, then we have the ST segment, length correspond to AP duration ventricular muscle, and then we have the T wave due to ventricular repolarization. Uh, now we should also know some more terms like what is alveolar ventilation that is equal to respiratory rate times tidal volume minus dead space air volume. So alveolar ventilation is the amount of gas that reaches the functional respiratory units or it's the amount of atmospheric air that can undergo the gas exchange. Now tidal volume as I already told you it's the amount of air breathed in and out of the lung and the normal value of tidal volume is 500 ml where 350 is for alveolar ventilation and 150 ml is for dead space. Now what is dead space? Dead space is the volume of air not participating in the gas exchange 
is typically 150 ml, like volume of non-ventilated gas in the airways. So that amount of air that is trapped in the conducting zone, like trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, until terminal bronchial, which is a conducting zone, the air is the dead space air, which is not involved in gas exchange. That's where the air is just filtered up, warmed up, bacteria are removed. Then the respiratory zone is actually where the gas exchange happens, which is made up of the respiratory bronchioles and your alveoli. Always remember the, the exchange of the gases, it happens from the higher partial pressure to the lower partial pressure between the pressure differences we have. Now the gas solubility, there's one law called as Henry's law. So more is the partial pressure of gas, more is the solubility of the gas. Also, when the membrane is thicker, definitely diffusion is less. When you have less surface area, you have less diffusion like that happens in emphysema. Now we can see a very important topic of Bohr's curve where we have the left shift and the right shift of the curve. So right shift of the curve is mainly the compensatory curve that happens under acidic condition, decreased pH, increased PCO2, increased 2,3 dPG, increased temperature. Like in case of exercise, high altitude, anemia, you will have right shift. When there is a right shift, oxygen is released. Oxygen hemoglobin bond is broken and oxygen is released to the tissue. While left shift happens just in opposite factors when you have more pH, less temperature, more 2,3 dPG. Like in carbon monoxide poisoning, you have a left shift. When oxygen hemoglobin bond is together and oxygen is not available for the tissues. Now we can see here. Uh, there is one more effect called as Haldane effect that whichever gas has more partial pressure, the hemoglobin is going to bind with that. Now, oxygen content is total amount of oxygen carried in the blood. We should know that the anemia is affecting the oxygen content in the blood and not affecting the partial pressure of the oxygen. So, one gram of hemoglobin is carrying around 1.34 ml of the oxygen. The majority of oxygen as we know is carried in the blood in the form of oxyhemoglobin while for carbon dioxide it's mainly transferred in the form of bicarbonate ions in the serum. A very less portion is bound to hemoglobin in the form of carbamino hemoglobin and some fraction directly dissolved in the blood. Now you can see the chloride shift. So chloride shift is uh, that happens on the inside the RBC. Inside the RBC, we can see that the carbon dioxide is combining with the water, making carbonic acid. This carbonic acid will dissociate into H ion and bicarbonate ion. Bicarbonate will leave the RBC and chloride will enter the RBC. Now, finally, we see here in this slide that is causes of hypoxemia, right? So, there are different causes of hypoxemia like decreased fraction of inspired oxygen, ventilation perfusion mismatch hypoventilation, shunting, and diffusion limitation. So what's the difference between hypoxia and hypoxemia? Hypoxia is decreased oxygen in the tissues that happens at PO2 less than 60, while hypoxemia is less oxygen level in the blood where PO2 is less than 80. Always remember hypoxia leads to vasodilatation of the blood vessels supplying the tissues. Only in the lungs, hypoxia will lead to vasoconstriction, which can cause pulmonary hypertension. Now we can see the hyper and the hypoventilation. So hyperventilation like an anxiety attack when you are breathing too much of carbon dioxide out that will decrease the carbon dioxide in your blood and decreased carbon dioxide will cause vasoconstriction of the blood vessels supplying the brain that can make you dizzy, faintness or unconsciousness. Now we can see what is pulmonary chemoreflex. So pulmonary chemoreflex is lung hyperinflated that will cause firstly the apnea, then rapid breathing that is called as tachypnea, then bradycardia, then hypotension and mainly the chemoreflex is mediated by the J receptor. You can see the function of stress receptor, J receptor and irritant receptor. J receptor are important, they are found in the alveolar wall and they are mainly stimulated by fluid uh, engorgement of capillaries or fluid within the lungs due to pulmonary edema or due to pneumonia. Now we can see uh, this is about the chemoreceptor, the respiratory drive. So we know we have two types of chemoreceptor, the central and the peripheral. Central chemoreceptor are present in the medulla and peripheral chemoreceptor is the carotid and the aortic body. So peripheral chemoreceptor, they mainly get activated by increased partial pressure of carbon dioxide or decreased PO2 less than 60 mm, while the central chemoreceptor and the medulla, they are mainly activated by increase in H ions. 
So when there is increased partial pressure of carbon dioxide, it will diffuse from the blood vessels into the CSF, which combines with the water to make carbonic acid. And this carbonic acid will dissociate into H ion and bicarbonate ion. The H ion will stimulate the central chemoreceptor and that will cause the hyperventilation. So whatever you have more PCO2 due to hyperventilation with the central chemoreceptor, it will blow out. That's how they are compensating. Now we can see different types of metabolic processes too. See on the next slide. So we can see this is the glomerulus. Okay, then we have the proximal convoluted tubule. Then we have the loop of Henle, the descending limb and the ascending limb. The ascending limb has a thin and the thick part. The ascending limb will continue as DCT. DCT will continue as a collecting duct where we have the cortical, the upper portion and the lower, the medullary portion of the collecting duct. That collecting ducts are going to open into minor calyces that will open into major calyces. Major calyces will open into papillae and finally opening into the pelvis. And pelvis will open them into the ureter. Ureter will open to the bladder and bladder, bladder will finally open to the urethra. Now we should know about the reabsorption, secretion and the excretion. Reabsorption when the solute go back to the circulation, secretion is secreted from the tubular cell into the tubular fluid and finally the tubular fluid will end up in the urine. We should know the proximal tubule that is having the maximum absorption of the ions like water, sodium, potassium, glucose, protein, bicarbonate ion, they are all reabsorbed at PCT. The descending limb of loop of Henle is impermeable to salt but permeable to water while ascending limb is impermeable to water but permeable to salts. DCT, calcium reabsorption happen regulated by PTH hormone and on the collecting duct, the cortical collecting duct, aldosterone is acting that helps in sodium reabsorption while the medullary collecting duct, ADH is acting that helps in water reabsorption. Also, your potassium, ammonia, drugs are being secreted. Now, you can see the countercurrent mechanism here that will help in creating the concentrated urine. It mainly happens in the loop of Henle. So you have the ascending limb where the water is being impermeable but the salt is being reabsorbed. So it will create a dilute fluid at the ascending limb of loop of Henle because it's not getting reabsorbed here. So dilute urine finally will get concentrated at the medullary collecting duct level where the ADH acting on echoporin receptor will help in reabsorption of more water. Also, since the salt is reabsorbed at the ascending limb level, that will create hyperosmotic interstitium. Interstitium are the tissue surrounding the tubule that will get highly concentrated because of sodium in it. That will also help in attracting the water finally at the collecting duct level when the urine will get concentrated again. Now we can come to the next sub chapter, the GI physiology. GI, as we know, has its own nervous system, the entric nervous system. So with the main trick and the Orbash plexus. And there's a good table of different hormones that you have in GIT, like gastrin, cholecystokinin, secretin, GIP, somatostenin, should know all the functions of them. Now we can see about the entrogastric reflex, that is when your duodenum is full with the chyme, your pyloric pump is inhibited, that is decreasing your gastric emptying and dec decreasing your gastric motility. So these entrogastrone hormone will trigger the entrogastric reflex, which is secretin, cholecystokinin and GIP, which are produced by your duodenum. Now we can see different stages of gastric secretions. Cephalic phase is important, that is caused by the parasympathetic activation. Go through it. And this is called as the hypothalamo endocrine end organ axis. So hypothalamus is controlling both your anterior and posterior pituitary. So hypothalamus will produce the releasing or the inhibitory factor that will reach the pituitary. Pituitary will produce trophic hormone or stimulating hormone when it receives those factors from the hypothalamus. And this uh, stimulating hormone or trophic hormone from the pituitary will then act on the actual gland to produce the hormone. For example, TRH is produced by hypothalamus that act on the pituitary to produce TSH and TSH will act on the thyroid gland to produce T3 and the T4 hormone. Hypothalamus is also controlling the posterior pituitary by the axons of the nervous system while the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary they are connected by the portal system or the system of the blood vessels. Now we can see different types of hormone here like you have the ADH we already know about the ADH and oxytocin that helps in milk ejection and uterine contraction 
during the birthing. Both ADH and oxytocin are produced by the hypothalamus, supraoptic and the paraventricular nuclei. Now we can see the pancreas. So the endocrine pancreas which is producing the insulin and the glucagon. So we can remember this as like a tug of war happening between uh, elephant and the five small animals. So the fat elephant on one side is the insulin that is decreasing your blood glucose and the other five animal on the opposite side of tug of war which are increasing the blood glucose is the glucagon, thyroxine, epinephrine, cortisol and the growth hormone. Insulin is the anabolic hormone which is synthesizing fatty acid into fat, amino acid into protein. It converts glucose to glycogen. While the other five uh, animals or other five hormones on the other side we have are the one which are catabolic that will break down fat to fatty acid, protein to amino acid, glycogen to glucose. Only one thing they are making is making the new glucose. Now about the action of the insulin and the glucagon. So insulin is going to decrease your blood glucose by promoting more glucose uptake and utilization by the cells and glucagon will increase your blood glucose. We'll discuss and see more functions of the insulin and glucagon. There's a good comparative table that you can go through it. Hi, my dear student who are preparing for IMDD 8 at a part two exam. Uh, thanks so much for watching this review video of the subject. If you really liked it, please buy the full version by clicking on the link given in the description. With the purchase of every video, you will be getting free live assessment and evaluations on the subject as well. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Dentabest channel now to get the latest updates on the smart videos. If you have any questions, please comment me in the box below. I, Dr. Seher from Dentavest, wishes you all the best for exam and thanks again for watching.